In Book 2 of the Nicomachean Ethics, Aristotle gives an account in which we develop virtue in just the way that any other skill or ability is developed, through consistent practice. The person who excels at basketball or golf has built up over time certain physical patterns of movement that enable their ability to shoot a basketball accurately or hit golf balls great distances. Likewise, someone who is exceptionally honest or courageous has also built up over time certain patterns of thought and action that enable them to resist the temptation to lie or that give them the ability to face danger when called upon to do so. Yet, as Aristotle himself realizes, this view leads to a problem. At the beginning of Book 2, Chapter 4, Aristotle considers the following objection. Someone might, however, wonder what we mean by saying that becoming just requires doing just actions first, and becoming temperate, temperate actions. For if we do just and temperate actions, we are already just and temperate. Similarly, if we do what is literate or musical, we must be literate or musical. This objection deals with how we begin to act with skill or virtue. If it is the possession of patterns of thought and action that permit us to exercise the various skills and virtues, then how do we get started? How do we act skillfully before we are skilled? How do we act virtuously before we are virtuous? I will refer to this as the priority of action problem. How is it possible to act in accordance with some skill or virtue before we have acquired that skill or virtue? That is, how is it possible for action to be prior to capacity? How can I play the lyre before I have acquired the skill of lyre playing? And how can I act courageously before I have acquired the virtue of courage? It is important to understand why this objection matters. Aristotle's account of moral development relies on the fact that we can develop virtue through habit and consistent practice. Again, virtue is not simply bestowed on us by nature. Yet, as we will see later in Book 2, Aristotle is also committed to the idea that virtuous actions have a distinct character. A truly virtuous action doesn't happen by chance or by accident. Such actions are the product of virtuous dispositions that have been deeply ingrained in us over time. Yet, it is precisely here where the problem lies. It is only through acting virtuously that we can develop a virtuous character. But at the same time, it seems that we can only act virtuously in the first place provided we already have that virtuous character. As such, we seem to be stuck in a circle. We cannot begin our quest for virtue because doing so seems to require that the quest has already been completed. Now, in order to see whether we can escape from this vicious circle, we need to think more about the connection between actions and character. Is it only perfectly virtuous actions that can contribute to forming a virtuous character? If so, then how could a beginner ever get started? Or, can we make real progress toward a virtuous character through imperfect action? But in that case, should we expect that such flawed first steps toward virtue would really lead us in the correct direction? We'll begin to take up these questions in the next section of this video. Here I will consider two responses to the priority of action problem that are suggested in Book 2, Chapter 1. Aristotle will have further comments on this problem in Book 2, Chapter 4, but we will leave those points to the side until a later video. One response to the priority of action problem could be that we learn by doing. 
Another response might highlight the role that teaching plays in bridging the gap between our first attempts at acting virtuously and then finally really developing the capacity for virtue. We will begin by considering the first response. Someone's first attempts at acting courageously are bound to be imperfect. The beginner might overzealously face unnecessary dangers, rationalize themselves out of fulfilling their duty, or simply be unprepared when their courage is needed. While these stumbles are expected of beginners, they are the sorts of errors that the genuinely courageous person would not commit. But all that being said, that doesn't mean that these imperfect actions are pointless. It doesn't mean that they aren't actually helping the beginner become more courageous and more virtuous. Consider a skill like shooting a basketball. On our first try, we will likely miss. But that doesn't mean our effort was wasted. This first attempt alone gives us a wealth of valuable new information. Whether, for example, we are shooting the ball with too much force or too little force. And this will enable us to learn how to coordinate our upper and lower body in the shooting motion. The same is true of virtue. Our first failed attempts at courage will also give us a wealth of valuable information. We will learn about what kinds of danger warrant our response and what kinds of responses are most effective in those situations. We will also learn important things about ourselves. For example, we will learn what situations are most likely to tempt us to be cowards. So our initial failures are actually quite valuable, and it is only because of these initial failures that we are able to improve and grow by repeated trials and correction. I believe this is what Aristotle has in mind when he suggests that what we need to learn before doing, we learn by doing. We can approximate the ideal of some skill or virtue even if we have not yet mastered it, and our first steps in that direction, even if they resemble stumbling in the dark, will often prove quite valuable. It is just this idea which is expressed in the following famous quote from the painter Vincent van Gogh. As practice makes perfect, I cannot but make progress. Each drawing one makes, each study one paints, is a step forward. And if Aristotle is right, then what is true of a skill like painting should also be true of virtues like courage, justice, and generosity. Provided our first failed attempts are genuine efforts at mastering the skill or virtue in question, and provided that we pay close attention to why those efforts failed, and are willing to learn from those mistakes, we should expect our imperfectly courageous, just, and generous actions to serve our ultimate goal of cultivating a virtuous character. Still, this response alone is not entirely adequate. Just now, I compared our first attempts at being skilled or virtuous to stumbling in the dark. Certainly, missteps and mistakes are necessary parts of the personal growth through which we master a given skill or virtue. But can we say the same about mere stumbling? This characterization suggests that growing and developing in virtue can come about through somewhat random or unguided actions. But that just doesn't seem very likely. If our first attempts at virtue really are random and uninformed, then it seems just as likely, perhaps even more likely, that we would be growing in vice rather than virtue. So, while complete mastery in a virtue or skill is not required to begin acting in a roughly virtuous or skilled way, don't we need at least some idea of what we're doing to get started? Mere stumbling alone, it seems, will not suffice. In the final section of this video, we will consider where such knowledge and guidance might come from. It is here, perhaps, that we might find that teaching plays a significant role in guiding our initial attempts at virtue. Aristotle emphasizes once again that it is from actually playing the lyre and actually building real things that we develop those abilities. 
But mere action alone does not ensure that we will become proficient musicians, effective builders, or virtuous people. Depending upon what sorts of actions we take, we might just as easily train ourselves to do these things poorly. It is from building well that people become good builders, and from building badly that people become bad builders. The act of building itself, or playing the lyre itself, or attempting to act courageously in itself, does not guarantee a good outcome. As Aristotle points out, if this were not so, there would have been no need of a person to teach them, but they would all have been born good or bad at their skill. We need teachers when embarking on a new skill, because without any guidance it is unlikely we will improve. In fact, it is more likely that acting without guidance will make us worse off by ingraining bad habits. Now, no teacher can guarantee that we will master a skill or virtue. As Aristotle has already argued in Book 2, Chapter 1, virtue cannot simply be taught. Only habituation and repeated practice can ultimately make us virtuous. However, a teacher can point us in the right direction by giving us a concrete conception of our goal and helping us to recognize, understand, and correct our errors. Aristotle points to the law as an example of this. The law itself functions as a teacher that guides us in our efforts at becoming virtuous. In fact, Aristotle goes as far as to say that, legislators make the citizens good by habituating them, and that it is in this respect that a good political system differs from a bad one. Now it might first seem strange to think that the law can play any significant role in helping citizens to be virtuous. After all, the force of a law, and perhaps even the nature of law itself, lies in the penalty which attaches to it. Insofar as people are motivated to pay their taxes or not steal property because of the law, it seems that what is motivating them is their desire to avoid being fined or imprisoned. Someone could perfectly follow the law, could pay all the taxes that they owe, and show perfect respect for property rights without really caring about any of these things. Such a person deep down may very much want to cheat on his taxes and engage in theft, but simply doesn't do so in order to avoid punishment. But in that case, it doesn't seem like the law is really teaching us anything about being virtuous. At most, isn't the law just coercing us into acting a certain way, perhaps even a virtuous way, but without changing our character for the better? So, as necessary as the law may be, it doesn't really seem to be playing the role of a moral teacher. What we need to keep in mind here, however, is that a moral teacher of any kind, whether it's a parent, friend, or even the law itself, is only really meant to help us begin the process of becoming virtuous. Again, no teacher of any sort can give us a virtuous character. Furthermore, even when the teacher in question is the abstract and formal law of the state, which admittedly can be followed without any real concern for virtue, there are still some legitimate benefits for the formation of our character. If the individual in question is so lacking in virtue that the only conceivable motive they can imagine for doing the right thing is avoiding punishment, then there probably isn't any teacher of any kind that will be able to reach this person. But fortunately, the vast majority of people are not like this. To be sure, we are all tempted to vice and wrongdoing, but our motive is usually just that temptation and the corresponding weakness of will to overcome and resist that temptation. And this is something that the law may really be able to help us with. Imagine someone who in a moment of weakness or greed considers cheating on their taxes. Suppose that in that moment they are only stopped from doing so because it is illegal. If nothing else, then, the law did at least make this person stop and think further about their choice. And that delay between temptation and action that the law forces upon us can be quite valuable. 
It could give us more time to think rationally about the right course of action and more time to realize that we were being taken in by our immediate lower desires instead of fulfilling our human function through the use of reason. In addition, since the law represents the accepted moral understanding of our community, we might be led to reflect upon why our peers have deemed this action so morally wrong that it is worthy of punishment. Furthermore, as Aristotle suggested when he stated that the law plays a role in habituation, the law forms our character simply by making certain behaviors familiar and routine. Mere repetition may not be enough to genuinely transform our character and to give us a love of virtue, but it can at least normalize virtue for us. It can make virtue the default and vice the exception. And this alone will help inculcate the patterns of thought and action that are characteristic of the virtuous person. Of course, none of these things can guarantee that we will ultimately become virtuous and honest people. On the one hand, the law itself can be corrupt, and it very likely is in some cases. But even if the law is not corrupt, the force of law still clearly does not ensure that people always make virtuous choices. However, the law does give us some real material for moral reflection and deliberation. It forces us to consider not just the personal consequences of our actions, but also the moral quality of our actions. It forces us to think seriously about why our political community has deemed this action to be outside the realm of acceptable conduct. And while this alone will not make us virtuous people, it is at least a good start. Ultimately, Aristotle sees the law playing a role in the life of a citizen that is similar to the role played by a parent in the life of a child. In making this point, Aristotle again emphasizes how the actions we take influence our character. He tells us that like states arise from like activities, and that it is on the differences between the activities that the resulting states depend. Because this is the case, because we must first act virtuously if we are ever to become virtuous, the time of early childhood will be crucial to our moral development. Aristotle emphasizes that it is not unimportant how we are habituated from our early days. Indeed, it makes a huge difference, or rather, all the difference. So, parents have a vital role to play in guiding their children on the path of virtue. But what exactly does the moral education of the child look like in his or her earliest days? At a very young age, a child cannot grasp the virtues intellectually. A child may not be able to understand that we shouldn't lie because it is disrespectful. The child may not be able to understand that generosity and courage are important because other people have needs and vulnerabilities. Furthermore, the child may not yet have a fully developed sense of fairness that would allow him or her to understand the importance of justice. However, the child can understand that certain kinds of behavior garner rewards from parents, while other sorts of behavior only earn them punishments. And through these associations, parents can steer the child's conduct in a virtuous direction. In this way, a parent can help the child make a habit of virtuous conduct. Notice, however, the similarities between parents and the law. In each case, the individual in question can be led to act in a virtuous way even if he or she has no real care for virtue and even if they don't really understand why the act in question is virtuous. In both cases, once again, this alone is not sufficient to make us virtuous. Developing a virtuous character requires a real commitment to virtue. Despite this, however, the individual in question is being habituated into virtue all the same. They are being encouraged, perhaps even forced in some sense, depending on the situation, into acting in a morally appropriate way. And the hope is that by doing so, people will gradually come to embody a virtuous way of life. 
The child may first tell the truth because she knows she will be punished if she does not. Or she might begin to share her toys because she knows she will be rewarded. But these initial lessons will, over time, give her the chance to realize the importance of the virtues, commit to practicing them, and give her a sense of pride, perhaps even enjoyment, in doing the right thing. In Aristotle's view, then, this form of teaching constitutes the first steps we take in the earliest days of our childhood toward the ultimate goal of inculcating virtue and achieving eudaimonia.